everyone. Welcome to At Home with Sally. I'm Sally Clarkson, and I have the biggest privilege in the world to be with so many friends from all over the world who join me every week to listen to my stories, inspiration, biblical encouragement, and I am just so glad that you're here today. Thanks so much for joining me. Hello, my friends. Welcome to Tea Time Tuesday. I hope you can grab a cup of tea. As a matter of fact, we're going to be talking about Scotland today because that's where I just was. And I read a quote that said, basically, everyone in Scotland knows that tea should be strong. And um, there are a lot of other quotes about it, but I have had great tea in Scotland before. But I hope you're doing well. I hope you will enjoy this particular uh, podcast, and I'm going to take you on a tour through Scotland. Um, I think that uh, as I look back on my own life, um, this this is a whole story about Bonnie Scotland. And please know that this is not an actual Scottish accent. I don't pretend to, but it's fun to try. And um, I was reading so many fun things about Scotland. But it says, When you are Scottish, the sound of pipes can put a wee spring into your step or bring a wee tear to your eye. When you are Scottish, the sound of the pipes, the bagpipes, can put a wee spring into your step or bring a wee tea to your eye. There's something so sentimental about Scotland I love the uh, the sing-songy uh, language, all the different things, and I'm going to be telling you a lot about it today. But uh, sometimes there are just places, I'm sure you feel like this, that wrap their vast beauty around your heart, and they kind of hold you there with a sense that you're experiencing another world. And from the first time I visited St. Andrews, Many years ago, when Joy was getting her master's, I was charmed, inspired, surprised. I was held with such a sense of belonging, and I thought, maybe my life story has a history or legacy in the past that brought great joy or fulfillment to my ancestors who lived there, and I feel it when I'm here. (laughs) You know, one of those mysterious thoughts that you have. But every time I leave this place... Um, I get tears in my eyes, uh, uninvited. Uh, They just spring to my eyes, and it's just, uh, uh, I think, partially what it represents to me is I live in such a busy time. I'm so active. I have things going, people to see, uh, too much work to do. And um, when you go to this small town of St. Andrews, and it's covered by Um, all around by the ocean, by the sea, um, constantly coming in and going out, the waves and and the abundant fluffy blue clouds. And you have these mysterious haunting ruins of a chapel. I'm going to tell you a little bit about all of it. And um, I just just love it. There's, There's kind of a kindness and a friendliness that ooze from the people that I know there and the people I, I um, just people in the street, people in the shops. There's this sing-songy accent. Um, Hello, how can I help you today? Um, today on Tea Time Tuesday, I'm going to take you on my trip and tell you all about it. But of course, as many of you know by now, the occasion for going to St. Andrews was for Joel's graduation. And you've heard a little bit about that. Um, but it's, it's a magical place that God kind of miraculously led our children into, and it's, it's had such a positive and blessed effect on their lives. Um, I think that I'm going to just jump in and tell you a few things about uh, my weekend and, and, and um, what I learned there, but... Um, I think that uh, just even the the train ride up there, it's a long train ride. It's supposed to only be about 
six and a half hours by the time we leave Oxford, go to London, change train stations, get in our train, and then go, get all the way up there. But um, the trains are, are now, they remind me a little bit of airplanes in that the seats are pretty close, and to be on a uh, that long of a ride, you need a little bit of grace. And so Clay and I and all my other kids always look for, they have sporadically throughout the trains, uh, these tables that have two people on one side and two people on the other side. Those are the premier places because you can put your sandwich down, your coffee or, or drink, water, whatever, water bottle. Uh, you can work on your computer there. It's just a little bit more um, of a comfortable place to be. And so that's what we had for most of the time until at the very end, uh, we think a guy that was high on drugs came and sat opposite us and jerked and kind of would have this funny little giggle and he was listening so loud to rock music. We're talking about a 35 to 40 year old man that um, even with his earphones in, we could all hear it all the way down the train. And he was just agitated and shifting and all that. So you, you never know who you're going to meet on these trains. But anyway, as you get closer and closer on the particular way that we went, you start seeing the sea, the ocean, and it's beautiful and, it, and it's wild and there are houses all along the way and um, there are uh, sheep that dot the landscape, a sheep here and there, and, um, and it just seems idyllic to me. And that's just uh, my own play. I like Scotland because it's a little bit mysterious and historical. And, um, and so uh, it was really fun. But it's, it's a gorgeous place, old stone houses. Um, and um, even in the old town of, of St. Andrews itself, these are, um, these are places that have been established and, and have actually lived in since the 1100s. And um, so the, um, the, one of my friends commented this week, a, a very, very American person, said every single building and every single house looks like it's straight out of a movie and, um, or a movie set. And uh, there's lovely old cathedrals, buildings, graveyards that are hundreds of years old. And so it is kind of like another world. Well, let me tell you a little bit about St. Andrews right now. The university was founded in 1413, and um, they brag because it was voted um, in two surveys as the number one school, overall school, in the UK last year. Um, and uh, that's why Joel getting his degree in the theology and imagination of the arts, it's a theological degree that um, not only studies theology and biblical history, but also it, it looks into the issues of how music, literature, art, movies, social media, culture is reflecting a theology of influence in faith. And either uh, these pieces of art are reflecting um, an unbiblical secular worldview or a biblical worldview and how art can be used in the world as a place of influence for faith-based, um, the proper worldview-based sort of truths. And so that's where Joel and Joyce chose to study to get their degree in, in that school. And um, they say the reason it was called St. Andrews is because uh, it was the resting place of the bones of the Apostle Andrew. <laughs> and, and so uh, they say that they have the, these bones um, stored in one of the cathedrals there. And they built these incredible, beautiful um, cathedrals. The, the cathedrals were started by Bishop Arnold. Uh, actually, first by Bishop Robert Kennedy. Isn't that interesting? We've heard that name before. Um, and then a new cathedral was built in 1160. You can see some of the remains of these cathedrals in my pictures on Instagram and on my blog today, and by Bishop Arnold. And um, they built these huge churches 
and the work was finally completed in 1318. And you've heard of Robert the Bruce? Well, Robert the Bruce was at the ceremony when these incredible historical um, uh, uh, cathedrals were built. And um, so they, uh, they were these incredible places. And St. Andrews was a holy site where pilgrims from all over, especially Europe and Russia, but the world, came for one specific reason, to revere the relics of St. Andrews. And also, um, they said that this was the place where they could come to pray, to get closer to God, to be encouraged by the priests who had a heavenly faith. And according to the legend, the bones of, of course, as I said, St. Andrew, were carried to Scotland from Greece by the monk Regulus in the 350s. So the history of this town goes back to um, really the first, uh, just uh, the early years after Christ's death. So I'm going to tell you a little bit today about some of the food there. Um, it's funny because several of my friends, and even now my children, they've been living there too long, they love scotch eggs. A scotch egg is a boiled egg that they wrap in sausage meat, and then it's coated in breadcrumbs, and it's baked or deep fried. And I've actually tasted one, and it's pretty good. But it's an egg sausage meat wrapped around it, coated in breadcrumbs, and baked in deep fried now there's another thing that's really a Scottish dish, and it's actually something that I haven't been brave enough to eat. I just can't. It kind of reminds me a little bit of meatloaf, but it's a mashup, you know, kind of mashed all together, of diced lung, liver, and heart. Can you imagine? Diced lung, liver, and heart mixed with oatmeal, um, beef fat, suet, onion, and assorted spices. And they would, they would mix all of this up and stuff it, the raw ingredients, into the stomach of a recently slain sheep and boil the whole thing to a state of palatability. In other words, they would boil it until it was cooked through and through. And um, I know that uh, people, even my children, eat haggis. Um, and uh, so if you ever want to really have a Scottish experience, get a scotch egg and eat a little bit of haggis. One of my favorite things too is, and we used to participate in this in the United States, but have you ever heard of a Kaylee? Kayleys are, uh, remind me of what I might in America consider a square dance, where people young and old, children and um, youth, uh, all ages of people gather together and they do these very organized dances. Um, and they hold hands and go under and go in and go out. And they have Kayleys all over the place. We even were walking the other night and passed by a Kaylee where there were all these people dancing to this wonderful, wonderful music. And um, what I want you to know, too, is that um, passing uh, men from time to time who are wearing kilts, the full kilts, um, hearing bagpipes, at different times throughout the day, and you never know when, it is a real part of, uh, of what I experience when I come to St. Andrews. So you're on this historical place where they have these old churches where in some of the biggest churches I've ever seen, the foundations of them in the world, that is right upon the ocean where countless people came to worship and to pray and had gone before me in this place praying. So I pray there every time I go. Um, and then you hear the bagpipes going, and you go have a warm cup of tea uh, inside one of the beautiful cafes, a, uh, a fresh dose of fish and chips. We always get fish and chips when we're there. And it's just like entering into another world. So um, I wanted to tell you, too, while we're talking about music, that I have found um, a wonderful new station on, um, on my Spotify, and it's called Celtic, that's C-E-L-T-I-C, -E Celtic Guitar Music 
Scottish locks, L-O-C-H-S. And a loch in Gaelic, which is the old Scottish language, means lake. Um, and so the, the old language, the Gaelic language, was mainly spoken in the highlands and on the small islands that surround um, the, uh, the country of Scotland. So listen to that Celtic guitar music. It's very lilting and, I think, interesting and yet soft enough to have on in the background. All right, so I wanted to tell you that one of the things I drank a lot of when I was there this time is um, there are many kinds of tea that I like, not just Yorkshire Gold, though that's my favorite, but um, Earl Grey tea is uh, one of my favorite teas from before, and you can get it decaf or caffeinated. Um, I do watch my caffeine more than you would know, and so I drink a little of, of this tea, but... It's flavored with what they call the oil of bergamot. It's B-E-R-G-A-M-O-T. It looks like bergamot, but it's bergamot. And um, you can kind of smell it to know what it's going to taste like. And uh, it's something that I really love a lot. Now, I can't mention to you this beautiful um, land without telling you about one of my favorite movies over the years, a long time ago, and it's called Mrs. Brown, and it's, uh, it's in reference to Victoria, Queen Victoria, and after her beloved uh, son, Al, or, I'm sorry, husband Albert died, she spent much of her time in Scotland, and she said, I feel a sort of reverence in going over these scenes in the most beautiful country of Scotland, which I am proud to call my own, where I was such devoted loyalty to the family of my ancestors. For Stuart blood is in my veins. So she considered herself partially Scottish, and she loved to spend the time there. Well, the reason they called her Mrs. Brown is because there was a servant who delighted in taking great care of her after her husband died, and his name was Brown. And so they called her Mrs. Brown, kind of as a joke of, well, she is certainly spending a lot of time with him. But it's really an interesting show, and I enjoyed it a lot. But it will give you a little bit of an understanding of Scotland. Um, so I wanted to tell you, too, that some of my favorite writers of children's stories are from Scotland. And you should read all of these stories that I'm going to tell you about today. First of all, we have Robert Louis Stevenson, and he was a Scottish novelist, essayist, poet, and a travel writer. He's best known for his works called Treasure Island. And did you know that Robert Louis Stevenson was the one who wrote The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? He also wrote Kidnapped and a, a book called A Children's Garden of Verses. Well, when I was a little girl, um, it, there's these beautiful um, illustrations in my own big picture book that I had, but I had this big volume of A Child's Garden of Verses, and it had all of um, Robert Louis Stevenson's poems, and it. it had beautiful pictures of children, and that was my first real introduction to literature when I was a little girl. So be sure and read those books. Um, my children, um, even in their, I think it was uh, junior high and early high school years, uh, we read, uh, I think Sarah read Treasure Island out loud to all of us, and they just loved it. Now the next person is Robert Burns, also known familiarly as Rabbi Burns, uh, R-A-B-B-I-E, Rabbi Burns. He was a Scottish poet and um, a lyricist, and he's regarded as the national poet of Scotland and is celebrated all over the world. They even have a day where they gather together and um, have parties and calays and read his poetry. And then um, another person I just loved, and I've read a lot about his background, his name is Sir James Matthew Barry. And... Um, 
he was a he was the first baronet. <laughs> um, he was a Scottish novelist, a playwright, but what he's best remembered for is he was the creator of Peter Pan, and uh, we actually loved uh, hearing the real book of Peter Pan. I think we listened to it on an audio tape when we were traveling. But you need to know about this. And I'm building up to one of my favorite authors, also from Scotland. Do you know who Kenneth Graham is? Kenneth Graham was a British writer born in Edinburgh, Scotland. Edinburgh is about an hour south of St. Andrews. And um, he is most famous for The Wind and the Willows. So he wrote about Ratty and Molly. Um, and it's delightful. It's one of my children's favorite books that we read over and over again by Kenneth Graham. And another book that he wrote that many of you would be familiar with, maybe more with the movie than the book, is called The Reluctant Dragon. So um, there's so much more I could tell you about um, Scotland. It was, it was a favorite place of many people. As a matter of fact, um, I just wanted to read you a couple of these quotes from people that, of course, you know. But Winston Churchill said, Of all the small nations of this earth, perhaps only the ancient Greeks surpassed the Scots in their contribution to mankind. So, that's my best Winston Churchill voice. But he said that, um, that he thinks that Scotland invested in... Um, uh, passed on, surpassed only by the ancient Greece in their contributions to mankind. So there are many, many people here who are um, writers and politicians and inventors and all these different things. Voltaire said, We look to Scotland for all our ideas of civilization. So much was written about civilized living, civilized country uh, in Scotland. And then Benjamin Franklin said, Did not strong connections draw me elsewhere? I believe Scotland would be the country I would choose to end my days in. Um, I think that Scotland isn't oversettled. It's beautiful um, from coast to coast. And again, it has that magical, mystical lure um, to it. So that's the best thing I would say about that. Now, one thing I wanted to end on today, as we're talking about all of these different things, Scotland, um, especially St. Andrews, I believe that um, if you look into the history, there's so much interesting history, but um, the, the St. Andrews Way was um, as popular as the Camina, where people walk on the Camina uh, in Spain and all the way through hundreds of miles to um, as a pilgrimage, uh, as a way to wanting to get closer to Christ. And St. Andrews was um, a pilgrimage destination. There were, it was the second biggest one in all of Europe. And so hundreds and hundreds of people would come here, and they wanted to be closer to God. As I've said earlier, they wanted to, um, to give their special prayers there, and they wanted to be in the company of a people who had a great faith. But what happened, and I'm going to let you read about this, and you can make your own judgments, but during the Scottish Reformation, there were Reformations all over the world, and especially all over Europe, um, and some uh, very strong personalities came in, and they chose to pretty much decimate and destroy these incredibly large, gorgeous cathedrals where people had come to worship God for hundreds of years um, in rebellion to what they thought was something controlled by the Pope and the Catholic Church. And um, so there's, there's a lot of messy um, times in history that Christians have been involved in and that have fought for the sake of their own faith. But um, when you come and see the ruins, these were the ruins that lasted for hundreds of years as large, you can't imagine the scope of these cathedrals, they're huge, where people spent hundreds of years coming to grow closer in their uh, worship of God. 
Um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about what it looks like to not grow weary in doing good, to not grow weary in life. I was watching Sarah yesterday with her three littles, and all of them, of course, at the same time, have had a cough and a chest cold, and all of them have been sleepless at nights. And so, of course, Sarah and Thomas have also been sick. And just watching the kids crawl all over here, Mommy, 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 look at this, Mommy this, Mommy that. Um, and one of them crying because they just were so uncomfortable. And as I look back, I think, how in the world did I make it? How did I raise four children? Did I live through those early sleepless years, um, the constantly giving myself, uh, taking care of this child, taking care of this child, taking care of this child? But I look back now, and I, I tell you, I had so much fun this weekend because when our family is all together, or even when just some of us were together like this weekend, there's this close kinship and friendship and deep satisfaction as we share our lives together. And this fruit comes um, from sowing and watering and cultivating and being faithful for a very long time. Let us not become weary in doing good, Paul says in Galatians, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up, Galatians 6, 9. And there is an old hymn called the Hymn of Promise, and it speaks about how if you've ever seen a fruitful apple tree, I love apples, it all started from a tiny seed. You could never see the potential of what was ahead um, when a seed was planted into the ground and grew into something formidable. I love that God gives us so many metaphors um, and uh, unrevealed until it's seasoned, something God alone can see, is what I read online. Um, but anyway, my friends, um, when I look at, at Joel, um, boy, he... In doing his PhD, um, we are limited in our resources as a family. We give all that we can to our children. We give our time, our love, our finances when we can. But he had financial issues um, as he approached his PhD. Um, he had to change advisors um, because of just some situations. His, his PhD advisors, uh, he had difficulties getting his PhD uh, finished. He did it during... COVID, so he was two years without direct contact with his professors, um, and yet I saw him grow. I saw him um, say, I am going to do this. I'm going to finish this. I'm going to accomplish this, and he kind of put his head down and just worked his tail off to get to the end of this PhD where you go to a a couple of people, you have to justify your works to these people who are your external and internal um, judges. And I just watched, you know, sometimes we want to take our loved ones away from stress or from work, and yet oftentimes it's the making of their spiritual and mental muscle. And that's the same with us. We are building our spiritual, our character our virtuous muscle when we walk with God, when we take one more step. In Hebrews 12, 1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. And then one of my faithful verses in my life in Philippians 4.13 and I take this by faith and then I take one more step one more day I can do all things through him, through Christ who gives me strength whatever difficulty you are going through he will give you the grace to do all things that you need to do even as Jesus had the grace to go to the cross, even though he didn't want to. It doesn't mean your life is easier, that you have to like it all. But in a fallen world with consequences of fallen, difficult people and 
illnesses and accidents. We can do all things. And when you go to the finish line, when you get to that place, you're going to think, oh my goodness, this life is more fulfilling. This life is more promising. God is good. And I see the fruit of faithfulness borne out in the lives of the people that I had the opportunity to trust and to be with. Well, my friends, there's so much more that I could tell you, but I think that it's time for me to go. (laughs) Um, The sun has been going down uh, since I've been talking to you. It is almost 10 o'clock at night, and I've got miles to go before I sleep. So anyway, I pray that this will have been of great encouragement to you. Um, I am slowly but surely. um, I think my voice sounds better than it did last week, though I still have a hoarse voice, and uh, I've had a little bit of difficulty swallowing and breathing, but I'm working on that. And um, I hope that you can still listen to me, and I hope you can turn your volume way up so that you can hear me. Let me pray for us today. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for letting me have a few days away in Scotland and to see the beauty, to see your fingerprints of design in that gorgeous um, hillside country and to see the ocean and to meet the people and to hear the history. Lord, thank you for the fact that you allow us to become refreshed in getting away. Refresh my precious friends. Give them time this year, this summer, or wherever they are in the world, that they can uh, have moments of restoration, of reflection, of goodness, of joy in their lives uh, from you, from the designer of all that is good and acceptable and perfect. And Lord, I thank you for the faithful people, the faithful um, musicians, the faithful writers, the faithful um, pastors and godly leaders that have gone before us to leave us a legacy of faith. I pray that you would give us a vision to know that living a legacy of faith, even in the quiet spaces, will produce for us fruitfulness beyond our imagination. Bless my precious friends today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, my friends, I hope you have a really good week. And um, my life is crazy busy right now more than you can imagine. But I just want you to know that I will be praying for you as I do every week. Have a great one, and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye. I hope you've enjoyed our time together today and that you'll join me next week. Be sure to look for more inspiration on my blog at sallyclarkson.com. Thanks for joining me. Bye-bye.